In this video on literary devices, I'll be discussing imagery. So first, I want you to try and imagine this. Try and really picture it in your mind. Bob woke up, then he made and ate breakfast. He showered, brushed his teeth and got dressed in his school uniform. He was finally ready to leave the house and so, he walked to the bus stop. He went to school where he learned history, science, maths and French that day. In the middle of the day, for lunch, he ate a sandwich. At 4pm, he got the bus home, where he played on his PS4 for a few hours until dinner. He ate lasagna. At 10pm, he eventually went to sleep. Now, you may have found it difficult to really picture this in your mind. I'm sure you couldn't think what Bob looked like, what his breakfast tasted like, um, what his dinner was like, or what his day was like in general. That's because there's no imagery. It's boring, and it's hard to have a vivid image in your mind. Now let's see what it looks like, or what part of it looks like with imagery. Bob woke up as if there were an emergency, like sleeping was a dangerous thing. The siren that was his alarm was deafening. He slammed it off with the palm of his hand and there was silence again. It was time for him to get up. He pulled himself out of bed and tried to rub the blurriness from his vision. He needed to start the day. It was a struggle as Bob was certainly not a morning person. But he made breakfast. The smell of the warm butter melting on his charred, blackened toast filled his nose. Now this time, I'm sure it was a lot easier for you to imagine the charred, blackened toast, what it smelt like as the butter melted on it, what it looked like. I'm sure you could hear the alarm going off and him slamming it into silence. You might have been able to picture the blurriness that Bob saw. This is because of imagery. So what is imagery? Well, in literature, imagery refers to the author's use of vivid and descriptive language which adds depth to their writing. It allows the reader to create visual representations of ideas in their minds. It also helps the reader to understand the work better. So as a literary device, imagery should appeal to sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste, the five basic senses. So. I want to read a quick excerpt from Charlotte's Web. Fern came slowly down the stairs. Her eyes were red from crying. As she approached her chair, the carton, uh, the cardboard box, wobbled, and there was a scratching noise. Fern looked at her father. Then she lifted the lid of the carton. There, inside, looking up at her, was the newborn pig. It was a white one. The morning light shone through its ears, turning them pink. Now, I'm sure you've heard the saying, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? But it doesn't really take a thousand words to create a vivid picture. The author's done it here in 61 words, and she's really able to describe what Fern looks like. You can picture her eyes red from crying. You can picture the box wobbling with a white pink inside as its ears turn pink from the sunlight. Now let's look at some more examples of imagery. These pertain to sight. The first one, he took her hand and led her to the edge of a cliff. The verdant vegetation that spread before them dazzled her with every shade of green. Now verdant just means really, really green and different shades of green and applies to plants and stuff. And it dazzled her, which has connotations with diamonds. So really sparkly in every shade of green. You can picture that. Together, they sat at the shoreline. The shimmering sun was sinking into the sea, and as it disappeared, she told him they'd never meet again. Here we have some alliteration, shimmering sun sinking into the sea. And again, shimmering has connotations with diamonds uh, or sh sparkly stones, and you can really picture this golden sun that's striking um, going down and sinking into the sea as the sun sets. The next example, she accepted the bouquet. It was filled with her favourite flowers. White roses, purple irises and soft pastels of lilies. The flowers swayed in the breeze almost as if they were dancing in her delight. Here we have um, some, a simile, as if they were dancing uh, and we can imagine them swaying in the breeze. They've also taken the effort to describe the colour of each flower. And finally, 
he took the tattered leather bound book from her. The cover was so faded, it was hard to make out the title. He was instructed to open it, but feared the anthology would crumble to dust. So this really gives us the image in our mind that the book is so old, it's tattered. Um, the cover's faded, you can't make out the title. And the thought that it would crumble into dust, that kind of hyperbole there, uh, that over-exaggeration, really gives the impression that the book is super old. I'm able to picture a really old book. Let's look at some examples of sound imagery. Around her, there was no peace. A baby screamed. A car horn was beeping. A nearby couple were arguing about something or other. A dog was barking. She could feel the anger bubbling up. So there's a description of many things, uh, many sounds around the, this woman. It really allows us to see the, see the sight, put ourselves in the setting. This example, the heavy banging on the door made him leap to his feet. Thud, thud, thud. It was getting louder and louder. There's some onomatopoeia there. Thud, thud, thud. Really good use of a literary device for imagery, for sound imagery in particular. The next example, the silence of the room was unnerving and put everyone on edge. Hearing a pin drop at this moment wouldn't have been difficult. So this time there's no sound. The absence of sound is imagery itself and they're describing the silence as unnerving. They use hyperbole again. Um, hearing a pin drop wouldn't be difficult. And finally, hedge crickets sing and now with treble soft, the red breast whistles from a garden croft. We have a little poem there, or part of the poem, an excerpt, um, and it describes again the sounds that can be heard. The next is smell imagery. This whole excerpt, the street stank, stank of manure, the courtyards of urine, the stairwell stank of mouldering wood and rat droppings, the kitchens of spoiled cabbage and mutton fat, the unaired parlour stank of stale dust, and the bedrooms of greasy sheets, damp feather beds, and pungently sweet aroma of chamber pots. So lots of descriptive language. Um, there's strong verbs like stank. There's um, really, really good adverbs like pungently. There's lots of adjectives, greasy, damp, unaired. Let's look at this one. A strong, putrid smell of rotted fish filled the air. He knew that they had arrived in Yarmouth. Now, even before we get to the part about rotted fish, the putrid smell that adjective the strong putrid smell already gives me a sense of the just horrible smell that's there the next one the stench was overbearing so instead of using the word smell they've used the word stench just to make that imagery even more powerful and they've said it's overbearing it was gunpowder it filled the air although not an awful smell but to him it was synonymous with death and finally the smell of lavender filled my nostrils. As soon as I laid my head on the pillow, it was soothing, subtle, yet not overpowering. So they described the, cell, uh, the smell and how strong it is. The next is touch imagery. First example, she ran her hand across the dark concrete wall. It was cold as ice, my simile there. When she came to the middle of the room, she felt a thick, slimy sub sub substance actively oozing down the wall. Now, words like oozing really give a sense of just how gross it is. I can feel that. That word makes me feel the thick, slimy substance. As I tumbled down the hill, the loose rocks raced alongside me, pricking my hands and face like a hundred tiny knives. Another simile there, and it really allows me to feel these rocks hurting me like lots of little knives. I had no choice but to pet his cotton soft fur. I ruffled his floppy ears, and he slapped his velvet paw into my hand. So as a metaphor, velvet paw, the word ruffled makes me think of something soft that can blow easily, and this cotton soft fur. And finally, he wrapped the butterfly soft cashmere throw around her shoulders and drew her close. The next is taste. The strawberries tasted like the sweetness and freshness of springtime as Kim had her first berry cobbler of the season. So they're comparing the taste to a time of year. Now, that's going to have a big connection with many readers as they think of themselves at that time of year and the foods that they might eat. The next example, the rich, creamy sweetness of the homemade ice cream was an amazing treat on a hot summer day. Really allows you to taste that ice cream. 
The next example, Joe plucked an apple right from the tree and crunched into it. The tart juice is filling his mouth and running down his gym, his chin. So he crunched into this apple and it's so juicy, these tart juices, I can taste that flavor. Uh, and it just feels so juicy as well, the fact that it fills the mouth and runs down the chin. And finally, Sue thought she was biting into an orange slice, but, it, but was shocked as her mouth exploded with the bitter taste of lemon. The word exploded gives you a sense of how powerful it is. And it describes the taste as bitter. But why do we do all this? Why do we look at imagery? Well, to illustrate, let's look at this excerpt from The House on Mango Street. But The House on Mango Street is not the way they told it at all. It's small and red with tight steps in front and windows so small you'd think they were holding their breath. Bricks are crumbling in places and the front door is so swollen you have to push it hard to get in. There is no front yard, only four little elms the city planted by the curb. Out back is a small garage for the car we don't own yet and a small yard that looks smaller between the two buildings on either side. There are stairs in our house but they're ordinary hallway stairs and the house is only one washroom. Everybody has to share a bedroom. Mama and Papa, Carlos and Kiki, me and Nenny. Now, upon analysis, you can really see and smell this red crumbling house. You can visualize this house that's crammed between other houses with only a tiny yard in the back and a couple of trees out the front. The author includes tactile imagery. So you can imagine yourself struggling to open a door that is so swollen you have to push hard to get in. It's obvious that the author has used imagery to describe the scene. But again, we really need to analyze why. It's important to ask ourselves, why did they include these specific images? What purpose do they serve? It was done for a reason, and we have to investigate. In this case, the author includes powerful imagery so that, the author, so that readers can sense the disappointment and shame and sadness the child feels when she looks at her new house. They, presumably her parents, had told her about the house, but it's not the way they told it at all in reality. They appear to have described it very differently. The child doesn't see the house as anything she wants to live in. She simply sees a run-down, tired old house. That isn't at all what she imagined. The purpose of this is to create a disappointed, sad tone, but also allow us to put ourselves in the character's shoes, connect with the character more. It emphasizes the tone and the character development. Let's look at another example. Specifically this time, how we might analyze four tables, paragraphs, or essays. Now, this pertains to the story Lord of the Flies about a group of British schoolboys who get stranded on an island. Now, from the beginning of Lord of the Flies, William Golding, the author, depicts the island not as a paradise, but as deadly through the use of imagery, which he uses to describe the beach. Scattered among the beach are skull-like coconuts and decaying palm trees, which could not grow to any height when they reached perhaps 20 feet and fell and dried. Now, if you've watched the analysis video, you'll understand the level one, two, three. Um, but this is how we can really, really analyze imagery. So the imagery, um, skull-like coconuts, decaying palms, really make the reader think of death. Skull like being a simile, uh, connected to skulls, obviously, and skeletons, which obviously bring images of death. And decaying, another word for palm, uh, sorry, another word for dying, uh, makes us think of death again. Added to this, the fact that the trees die young and do not grow old, they fall and die when they get to a certain height, is possibly foreshadowing. So the imagery here is really important. The island, through this imagery, is revealed to be a place filled with death, indicating it's not the paradise that the children might think it is. Furthermore, the boys might not grow old and die young, as the foreshadowing suggests. And finally, when comparing to the world around us. Um, I think this imagery is really important because typically in adventure stories where people are stranded on an island, it is typically a paradise with blue lagoons, glistening blue lagoons, white sandy beaches, beautiful colorful parrots. But in this case, there's dying trees. I think that's really important here. Thanks for watching.